Welcome to the fifth video in our training series for Project Waffles. This presentation will cover uh, the habitat survey portion of the project. Before I get started, I want to do a shout out to our Utah State Coordinator, Neil Paprocki. He assembled most of this content last year for some training he put together for his volunteers and has graciously allowed me to leverage it for the whole program. So today we'll be talking about the ha habitat survey work at e each survey point, uh, when to do that assessment, uh, the habitat classes, and we'll talk a bit about the grazing measures as well. As always, uh, I suggest that you read the protocol and have the protocol with you during the survey. There's a lot more detail in there on some of these classifications. There's also some of these photos that will help you uh, choose one category versus another. That's available on the website under the survey resources. So first of all, the habitat surveys. Uh, you'll do this at each point. Uh, this uh, is a snapshot of the data sheet up above uh, here. and um, We'll do it on each point and each survey visit. Now much of the habitat will not change between visit one and visit two, but we ask that you repeat the habitat survey, uh, especially in cases like agriculture where, the, um, where it may have gone from a fallow field to a tilled dirt field or from a dirt field to a green field. Uh, that, those measures are important to us. We also recommend that you do the habitat before you complete the survey. Like maybe go out early, visit all your points, set up your points, collect the habitat data, especially on your first visit while you're still familiarizing yourself with the protocol. And that gives you plenty of time uh, to get your survey points in during the survey window that I talked about in the last training. Um, if you do the habitat right after each uh, owl survey, you only have a couple minutes to complete that habitat to get and then get on to the next point uh, so that you can get a full 11 points in on the survey. So we record habitat within 400 meters of the point and uh, four meters and yards are roughly equivalent so 400 yards of the point. Uh, that may be difficult to estimate but one trick we use is most uh, country uh, power poles are 100 meters apart. Uh, so when we're collecting data, just like in owl observations, 200 meters is two power poles distance. In this case, we're going to be looking at a 400 meter radius around the point, so the equivalent of four power poles distance circle around the point. Um, and we're collecting the habitat data to the nearest 10%, so don't overthink these classifications. Um, just, just uh, we need the broad category. It doesn't matter so much that the difference is between 10% and 20% as it does between 10% and 50%. And then just to emphasize, please double check that all your numbers add up to 100%. In the example up above here, we had high shrubs at 20%, cheatgrass monoculture at 20%, complex grassland at 10, and agriculture stubble at 50. That totals up to 100%. Whenever we use the terms low and high uh, for vegetation, uh, roughly equate that to knee height. So low shrubs would be uh, shrubs uh, shorter than knee height, and high shrubs would be shrubs higher than knee height. Uh, so the shrub, shrubs may also include grass, and I'll give you some examples of that. A lot of our shrublands in the West have grass around them and that's fine, it's still considered shrubland, as long as there's a regular distribution of shrubs. Even if the shrubs are, are 10, 20 feet apart, but there's a regular distribution across the landscape, I would still consider that shrubland versus grassland. So whether there's the habitat has the complex structure of shrubs present. Uh, contrary, uh, on the grasslands, there may be one or two shrubs out there, but they would be irregular and uncommon uh, or sparse, in which case we would classify that as grassland. And I'll give you some uh, photo examples of each. We do have four agricultural categories, uh, fallow, um, where we also put pasture in here. This may be unused, it's typically overrun by weeds and grasses, may have some shrubs in it as well. Um, bare dirt is, is dirt is visible and uh, new growth may be less than one or two inches on it, but uh, predominantly brown looking stubble is last year's growth. It's probably brown, um, but hasn't been overrun by weeds and, and grasses and other development. 
And then green would be new agricultural growth this season. Um, and then we also classify marsh and riparian landscapes, uh, presence of water or associated water vegetation such as reeds, cattails, etc. So here are some examples. Uh, this is a photo from Neil in southern Idaho uh, a few years back of some high shrub. This is fairly dense shrub cover uh, on the two sides of the roads here and greater than knee height. Uh, so we would put that as high shrub cover and it looks here to be dominant on the landscape. So within 400 meters, if, if the same view is behind us, we're probably looking at 80% at uh, or more high shrubs. Uh, this is what low shrubs would look like. Shrub uh, is the dominant feature on the landscape and it's lower than knee height. Uh, this would be an example of high shrub mixed with a lot of uh, forbs and grasses, but um, if shrubs are, are present on the landscape, we should err towards that category. So this is 100% high shrubs in front of us. Uh, this is also high shrub. While these shrubs don't look gr uh, too great, they are still regularly dispersed across the landscape and providing that complex structure that we would expect of a shrubland, uh, even though the uh, health of this particular one could be questioned. The next slide uh, is definitely not shrubs. Uh, so there are some burned out shrubs here, but uh, no green growth, and they aren't really providing the structure protection uh, uh, that we would expect of a true shrub on the landscape. They are probably enough here that if they were all alive, we might call it shrubland, might call it grassland. Uh, but since they're dead and burned, I would, I would refer to this as grassland. And here's another example. One healthy shrub in the center, but surrounded by grass. That is not a shrubland environment. I would consider this grassland. When we're talking about grassland, we have two different classes. Basically, we're looking for cheatgrass, monoculture, and everything else, which is typically a more complex grassland. So the cheatgrass um, is, is fairly pervasive in the West, but we will survey many areas where cheatgrass is not present. Um, but this is what it would look like at its um, full growth. And this is a zoomed in version. Cheatgrass usually these seed heads start to turn red fairly early in the season, but we should complete our surveys prior to that occurring. Um, and so uh, you can see the seed, how the seeds uh, dangle off the stem here on the right. Here's an example, probably a minimalistic example of a complex grassland. There's at least two different heights of grass. There's short green grass and then the tall, um, uh, taller, dead bunch, uh, some of it bunch grasses in here. And this would be a more, um, um, a more complex grassland, but both of those categories are, are classified as um, complex grassland. Moving to the agricultural areas, example of a fallow, fallow field here, uh, a lot of weeds growing up in it, various different types of the grasses. It's starting to look like a complex grassland, but there's evidence that it was agriculture at one point in time. Uh, here's dirt, obviously, and green. That green looks pretty short, but we can't see any dirt through it, so it's more than likely larger than two inches deep, and thus we would consider on the right-hand side green agriculture and the left-hand side bare dirt agriculture. And then this is a classic example of stubble. Uh, stubble is last year's brown growth that has just been mowed off and left on the field. Uh, this uh, provides a lot of cover for prey species, so there's oftentimes more prey in these environments. And that one of the reasons that we really like these environments is that shorter owls do like these environments as well. And then lastly, marsh riparian. Uh, this one's fairly obvious with lots of water present, but water may not be visible. Uh, but if there are reeds and cattails and such, we would classify it as Martian riparian. And then on the right-hand side of that uh, data sheet, there was an other category for if you can't fit it into any of these categories, don't overthink it, spend too much time on it, just put it in the other category and make sure the numbers total up to 100%. So moving on to grazing, um, we have these two boxes on the grazing. We're asking for the percent of habitat within 400 meters. So those four power poles distance around the point uh, that has been grazed or is open to grazing. 
and then we're counting the number of livestock visible. And these are domestic livestock, so we aren't counting antelope or deer, um, or, or the one that's a little trickier, we aren't counting wild horses, but we do count domestic horses. Um, and so it's just a quick percentage and a quick number that you can see on your visit. This is something that will likely change between your two visits. And on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we also collect other species observations. These are species that are usually species of greatest conservation need or species of concern in at least one or in most cases, most of our uh, survey states. Things such as long-eared owls, northern harriers, ferruginous hawks, burrowing owls, and long-billed curlews. A later, um, a later training video will cover those species in more detail. So how to really get at this grazing question? Sometimes it's obvious. Here's a photo from Matt Larson that uh, um, very grazed on the right, uh, much less so on the left. But sometimes it's going to be much more subtle. So you have to look for the presence of, of cow pies, or in the case of shrubland environments, you can often see that all the new growth has been trimmed back. Now, deer and antelope will do some of that, but if that's pervasive across that landscape, it's probably been grazed by domestic uh, animals. So that concludes our habitat portion of the training. Uh, I, owl identification will be next up, um, but in the meantime, uh, we encourage you to uh, follow us on Project Waffles' public Facebook page, and here's a shortened link to the official website with all our sign up and survey resources. It is case sensitive and you cannot have a slash at the end. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to contact your state coordinator. Their contact information is on the project website. Thank you for your time and your participation in this important program.